Chapter twenty five of Loafing Along Death Valley Trails by William Carruthers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five Ballarat Ghost Town. In the early eighteen nineties, gold discovered on the west side of the Panamint in Pleasant Canyon caused the rush responsible for Ballarat. For more than twenty years, the district had been combed by prospectors holed in at Post Office Spring, about one half mile south of the site upon which Ballarat was subsequently built. Here, the government had a small army post, and here, soldiers, outlaws, and adventurers received their mail from a box wired in the crotch of a mesquite tree. The Radcliffe, which was the discovery mine, was a profitable producer the timbers and machinery were hauled from ransburg over the slate range and across panamint valley to the mouth of the canyon there under the direction of oscar rogers it was packed on burrows and taken up the steep grade to the mine site copperstain joe a noted half-breed indian made the next strike with the specimen he went to mojave where he showed it to jim cooper for five dollars and a gallon of whiskey he led cooper to the site but his deal with cooper interested me less than the cunning of his burrow slick copperstain strode into a hardware store and asked for a lock it's for slick's chain picks a lock soon as i turn my back damn him the merchant showed him a lock of intricate mechanism he won't pick this costs more but worth it i don't care what it costs copperstain said and bought it later he looped the chain around the burrow's feet fastened the links with the lock and tethered slick to a stake that'll hold you he said defiantly the next morning he was back in the store belligerent hell of a lock you sold me slick picked it in no time impossible the burrow's gone ain't he copperstone bristled and reaching into his pocket produced the lock see that nail in the keyhole i didn't put it there slick just found a nail that's all the future of Pleasant Canyon seemed assured, and it was decided to move the two saloons and grocery to the flats below, where a town would have room to grow. When citizens met to choose a name, George Riggins, a young Australian, suggested the new town be given a name identified with gold the world over. Ballarat and his native country met the requirement, and its name was adopted. Shorty Harris discovered the star, the elephant, the world-beater, the St. Patrick, in tuba jail surprise and goler canyons more strikes were made it is curious that none were made in happy canyon the production figures of early mines are rarely dependable and the yield is often confused with that obtained by swindlers from outright sale or stock promotion my friend oscar rogers superintendent told me the radcliffe produced a net profit of approximately five hundred thousand dollars less authentic are figures attributed to the following the O B Joyful in Tuba Canyon two hundred and fifty thousand, the Jam in Jail Canyon a hundred and fifty thousand, and Shorty Harris's World Beater two hundred thousand. Among the noted of Ballarat residents was John Lemoyne, a Frenchman. He discovered a silver mine in Death Valley, but the best service he gave the desert was a recipe for coffee. He walked into Ballarat one day and had lunch. The lady who owned the cafe asked if everything suited all but the coffee john said how do you make your coffee she asked madam there's no trick about making good coffee plenty coffee damn little water from one end of death valley country to the other coffee is judged by john lemoyne's standard you may not always get it but mention it and the waiter will know for years lemoyne held his silver claim in spite of offers far beyond its value which he believed was five million dollars but once when the urge to return to his beloved france was strong and goldfield tonopah and rhyolite excited the nation he weakened and decided to accept an offer said to have been two hundred thousand dollars but he told the buyers it must be cash after a huddle john's demand was met and a check was offered john brushed it aside well this is not cash he complained no it wouldn't go to town to get to cash he had work to do you get eat disgusted the buyers left and john lemoyne continued to wear his rags eat his beans and dream of la belle france a young shoshone indian came into keeler excited as an indian ever gets looked up shorty harris and said short man your friend go out no come back maybe him sick it was midsummer but lemoyne had undertaken to reach his claim 
in the bottom of the valley shorty identified lemoyne's tracks by a peculiar hobnail which lemoyne used in his shoes he followed the tracks to cottonwood spring and there found an old french pistol which he knew had belonged to lemoyne convinced he was on the right trail he went on and after a mile or two met death valley scotty i know why you're here scotty said i've just found his body lemoyne was partially eaten by coyotes and nearby were his dead burrows though tethered to the mesquite with slender cotton cords which they could easily have broken the patient asses had elected to die beside him and there ended the dream of the glory trail back to the france he loved those who believe in the jinx will find something to sustain their faith in the record of john lemoyne's mine after lemoyne's death wild bill corcoran who had made and lost fortunes in the lush days of rhyolite set out from owens valley to relocate it never a ranting prohibitionist bill believed that the best remedy for snake bite was liquor in the blood when the snake bit when he reached darwin he was not feeling well and stopped long enough for a nip with friends and to get a youngster to drive his car and help in the camp it was midsummer with record temperature but bill wanted john lemoyne's mine becoming worse in the valley he stopped in emigrant canyon and sent the boy back for a doctor bill crawled into an old shack under the hill when the boy and the doctor came they found bill corcoran on the floor his hand stretched toward a bottle of bootleg liquor his soul had gone over the hill one after another five others followed bill to file on lemoyne's claim and each in turn joined bill over the hill lemoyne's christian name was jean his surname has been spelled both lemoyne and lemoyne the claim from which indians had formerly taken lead was filed upon by lemoyne in eighteen eighty two joe gorsline a graduate of columbia with a background of wealth came to ballarat during the rush looking over the town wouldn't spend another day in this dump for all the gold in the mint he announced he had a few drinks heard a few yarns eyed a few girls in the honkies it was all new to joe but something about the informalities of life appealed to him and in a little while he was renamed joe goose then the town's constable shot its judge and ballarat chose him to succeed the deceased not liking the laws of the code he made a batch of his own which were never questioned while watching the flow of time and liquor he went desert and put aside the things that might have been for the more alluring things as they are when ballarat became a ghost town joe gorsline took his body to the city but his soul remained and years afterward when he died a hearse came down the mountain and in it was joe gorsline home again he is buried in a little cemetery out on the flat and in the spring the golden sun cups grow all around and you can walk on them to get to his grave adding a cultural touch to ballarat was an english nobleman who going desert tossed his title out of the window donned overalls and brogans and promptly earned the approving verdict an all right guy soon he was drinking with the toper and dancing with the demi monde like others he did his own cooking and washing he lived in a adobe cabin which because it was on the main street had its window shades always down but there was one little custom of his british routine he never abandoned and this was discovered by accident he stopped in john lambert's saloon one evening before going to his cabin for dinner he left his watch on the bar and had gone before lambert noticed it an hour later lambert having an opportunity to get away took the watch to the cabin john thus reported what he saw he was eating his dinner and by god he had on a white shirt wing collar and swallowtail ballarat chuckled but no one suggested a lynching party they knew how deep grow the roots in the soil one loves maybe said lambert that's why john bull always wins the last battle they give up nothing a familiar figure throughout death valley country was johnny behind the gun small and wiry and as much a part of the land as the lizard his moniker was acquired from his habit of settling disputes without cluttering up the courts johnny whose name was sight accounted for three or four sizable fortunes having sold a claim for thirty five thousand dollars he once bought a saloon and gambling hall in rhyolite for swearing prospecting forever johnny advertised his whiskey by drinking it and the squareness of his game by sitting in it 
one night the gentleman opposite was overwhelmed with luck and his pockets bulged with thirty thousand dollars of johnny's money having lost his last chip johnny said i'll put up this place we play von hand und quit johnny lost he got up reached for his hat well my lucky friend i'll take a last drink with you he tossed the liquor lighted a cigar good night gentlemen he said i'll go find me another mine johnny had several claims near the keen wonder in the funeral mountains held by a sufferance not uncommon among old-timers who respected a notice regardless of legal formalities senator william m stewart nevada mining magnate had employed kyle smith a young mining engineer to go into the locality and see what he could find smith a capable and likable chap in working over the district located several claims open for filing by reason of johnny's failure to do his assessment work it is not altogether clear what happened between johnny and smith but smith's body was found after it had lain in the desert sun all day there being no witnesses the only fact produced by sheriff and coroner was that smith was dead johnny went free other escapades with johnny behind the gun occurred with such frequency that he was finally removed from the desert for a while as the guest of the state in a deal with tom kelly johnny was hesitant about signing some papers according to an understanding his trigger quickness was explained to kelly who was not impressed he went to johnny and asked him to sign up johnny refused kelly said calmly johnny do you see that telephone pole yes i see what about if you don't sign you're going to climb it johnny signed he put his gun away when he acquired a lodging house at beatty where he died in nineteen forty four reminiscing one day in the old saloon he had owned chris wicks slapped the bar i've taken as much as sixty five thousand dollars over this old bar in one month he had none of it now but in a little cabin in surprise canyon with a stream running by his door and a memory that retained only the laughs of his life he didn't need sixty five thousand dollars a city fellow came into the cafe one day snooty sort i told him we had some nice tender burro steaks he flew off the handle said he wanted porterhouse or nothing i served him when he finished he apologized for being rude and said his porterhouse was good as he ever ate i went into the kitchen and came back with a burro shank shoved it in his face and said mister you ate the meat off this burro leg i thought he'd murder me one day when ballarat travel was heavy a dapper passenger dropped off the stage entered the saloon bought a drink and paid for it with a twenty dollar gold piece getting nineteen dollars and fifty cents in change when he'd gone shorty harris standing by said chris that money doesn't sound right chris examined it the gold piece had been split hollowed out and filled with alloy chris worried a while then brightened when he noticed his place was full of loafers playing solitaire pulling at soggy pipes waiting for a live one boys said chris old whiskers ain't getting much play let's go down and see him whiskers was his competitor down the street a few moments later the batwing doors of whiskers place flew open and chris and his bums swarmed in chris laid an arm on the bar what'll it be fellas then he turned to the loafers along the walk line up you guys and have a drink they did and when the drinks were downed chris laid the phony gold piece on the bar received his change and with his crowd returned to his bar an hour later he was still laughing to himself over the trick he played on whiskers when his own sawed-off doors flapped open and whiskers barged in followed by his own mob of moochers whiskers ordered for the house and laid down the twenty dollars chris gulped and gave the change that coin circulated in every store and saloon in ballarat for more than a year everybody knew it was phony but accepted it without question and came to regard it with something akin to affection then one day a gentleman in spats came along and the twenty dollar gold piece left forever billy hyder a slim genial fellow who had been a hat salesman in a smart toggery shop in los angeles came not for gold but to escape alimony his easy smile matched a stubbornness that nothing could conquer she got a smart lawyer and dated the judge billy said he hung his bench-made suit on a peg slipped into overalls cut off one sleeve of his tuxedo to cover a canteen spread the rest on the floor beside his bed to step on in the morning and so transition eventually he began to prospect kept at it for twenty years found nothing 
but he beat alimony usually mines were salted in shaft or tunnel to separate the sucker from his money but it remained for a ballarat woman to find a simpler way michael sherlock known as sparkplug because of continual trouble with that feature of his automobile gave me her formula she owned a claim in pleasant canyon that had a showing of gold she wanted ten thousand dollars for it a rich auto dealer came along to look at it he was worth at least five million dollars she told him to take his mining engineer and get his own samples and when he got back she'd have a chicken dinner waiting they got the samples came down parked the car in front of her house got their bellies full of chicken and went back to the city a couple of days later the millionaire was back couldn't get his money into her hands quick enough word went out there would be work enough for all comers and we figured on boom times but he couldn't find ore to match her samples what happened i asked while he was eating chicken dinner that night her indian hired man went out to his auto and switched samples i asked sparkplug why he didn't sue her if you had five million dollars would you want the whole damn state laughing at you ransburg which boomed in the early eighties as a result of gold strikes in the yellow aster the king solomon and later the kelly silver mine soon became one of the principal eastern gateways to the panamint and to death valley by way of granite wells and wingate pass a curious story of a man haunted by his conscience is that of william dooley and told to me by dr samuel slocum who had come to ransburg from arizona after making a fortune in gold a howling blizzard had driven everyone from the streets and the campers in fiddler's gulch into billy hebron's saloon dr slocum lost in the blinding snow and stumbling along the street felt with his hand for walls he couldn't see while a barroom noise guided him to the door at the bar he saw william paddock mining engineer bill you're the man i'm looking for i can't find anyone who can tell me how to get to goler canyon in panamint valley you've been there and i want you to draw me a map paddock finishing a drink ordered one for slocum and introduced him to a man at his side this is mr dooley paddock said and the doctor saw a great hulk of a man with black whiskers small eyes and an uneasy look before a word was spoken slocum sensed dooley's instant dislike of him slocum ordered a round of drinks dooley refused and walked to the farther end of the bar paddock followed dooley after a moment talked with him and returned to his drink he said to slocum i'm in a curious situation i don't know much about dooley but down in mexico he saved my life now it's my turn to save his he just killed a man in arizona and came here to hide out i'm taking him to goler canyon soon as this blizzard is over he thinks you are a deputy u s marshal and claims he has seen you before and that you are no doctor well, he may have seen me in his arizona gold hill slocum said the best way i can tell you paddock continued is to sign the road as i go and after a day or two you can follow us on the day following paddock's departure dr slocum set out the next day he came upon a newly made grave outlined with stone on a redwood board used for the marker was carved this inscription here lies bill dooley who died by giving william paddock the damn lie with no reason to shed tears the doctor followed paddock's signs reached goler canyon made camp and knowing that paddock intended to occupy a stone cabin farther up the gulch he started up the trail he'd gone only a short distance when he saw paddock approaching waving his arms in signal for slocum to go back the doctor stopped when paddock came down he said for god's sake dog get back to your camp dooley is behind that big boulder above us with a winchester trained on you why i thought he was dead no paddock smiled grimly he worked all night digging that grave said it would throw you off his trail i can't get it out of his head you're a marshal slocum had made a grueling trip to free and open country and he had no intention of being driven out i'll go up and talk to him he said paddock warned him that it would be useless and might be fatal but slocum insisted and they went up the trail paddock going in front to shield him dooley was outside the cabin with a rifle in the crook of his arm his finger on the trigger slocum was unarmed he calmly assured dooley he was not an officer that he had no intention of disclosing dooley's whereabouts but this is free country and i intend to stay dooley's reaction was a non-committal grunt however violence was avoided 
when the doctor returned to his camp haddock decided it would be best to accompany him as a measure of safety explaining to dooley that he would remain with the doctor to inspect the claim he remained as a bodyguard for three days on the fourth he went up to the stone cabin and discovered dooley had loaded his wagon with all his camp equipment and supplies including a green water keg and left for parts unknown just across the range was hungry bill's country a year or so afterward dr slocum crossing the mountains into death valley stopped at hungry bill's six spring canyon ranch and noticed a green cask hungry bill said he'd found the keg floating on the ooze near badwater somewhere under that ooze dr slocum said lies bill dooley his team his wagon and its load an interesting character of this area was toppy johnson who scouted for senator george hurst and later had charge of copper claims belonging to william randolph hurst near granite wells while there toppy employed aunt liza a negro cook aunt liza came from ronsburg with an enormous trunk she was a good cook but an awful thief and nearly everything toppy owned except the furniture disappeared piece by piece when his razor vanished he looked through the trunk and found the loot he didn't want to lose aunt liza so he removed a few of the more needed things leaving the rest to be recovered by installments thereafter it was a game of losing and retrieving as strange a coincidence as i've ever heard attended the end of toppy johnson sent to mexico when pancho villa was overrunning the country he fled to mazatlan when pancho announced he would shoot on sight both native and foreigners who were not in sympathy with his marauding all boats were crowded with refugees both native and alien but toppy was permitted to join the hundreds willing to sleep on deck toppy unwittingly chose a spot over the saloon where drunken celebrants soon began shooting at the ceiling a shot penetrated the flooring of the craft's deck and toppy's abdomen an american physician sleeping alongside was awakened by toppy's groans attended him but saw there was no hope the physician asked his name the object being to notify the victim's relatives if my doctor were only here toppy moaned he would save me who is your doctor dr samuel slocum of pasadena toppy said and died the physician was dr slocum's nephew thirty-four miles south of ballarat at the end of a narrow canyon leading from wingate pass road into death valley one comes upon a breathtaking riot of color pink hills blue hills hills of dazzling white mottled with black and green yellow hills maroon and jade hills a gentleman of fine fancy and fluent tongue passed that way learned that under the hills was a deposit of epsom salts then he went to hollywood where salts met money he talked convincingly of nature's drug store just sink a shovel into the ground and up comes two dollars worth of medicine recommended by every doctor in the country no educating the public everybody knows epsom salts there was no flaw in that argument and hollywood dipped into its pockets a monorail was strung from searles lake over the slate range through wingate pass and up the slopes to the pink hills there rose epsom city for a while the balanced cars scooted along that gleaming rail bearing salts to market dreams of wealth to hollywood but the world had enough salts epson city failed nothing is left to remind one of the incredible folly but a few boards and a pile of bones the bones are those of wild burros slaughtered by vandals who in a project as inhuman as ever excited lust for money went through the country and killed the helpless animals to be sold to manufacturers of chicken and dog food a singular character known as dad smith who had come to california with john c fremont was one of the earliest settlers at post office springs smith had been a scout with kit carson in the apache wars in arizona and returned to the lower panamint in 1860 to hunt gold in butte valley where nearing ninety he dug a tunnel a hundred feet in length found there delirious with pneumonia by dr samuel slocum he was removed to the doctor's camp where mrs slocum nursed him through his convalescence when he recovered he decided to give mrs slocum a token of his gratitude at the time barstow and daggett were the most convenient stations for prospectors in the southerly area at daggett they liquored at mother featherlegs at barstow they bought at judge gooding's store or at aunt hannah's and drank at sloan and hart's saloon 
dad's money as was that of others was left with them for safe keeping so he walked every mile of a ten days round trip to get a box of chocolates for mrs slocum a little chore like that made no difference to dad he encountered a desert rain and arrived at the slocum cabin drenched they persuaded him to remain overnight and led him to a tent seeing that water dripped from dad's blankets dr slocum went for dry bedding when he returned dad had his own bedding spread on the ground here dad take this dry bedding not on your life dad said as he crawled into his own i catch cold sure as hell two noted athletes of the period went into the panama for a vacation when they asked for a guide they were told to get dad but after looking him over they decided he lacked stamina but engaged him when they could find no one else the route was over the panama into death valley and back through redlands canyon a trip to test the hardiest on the third day dad returned alone asked about his companions he grumbled oh they've down and out now i've got to go and haul em in he took his burros lashed the victims securely on the beasts and brought them in remembered by oldsters was archie mcdermott a big fellow of unbelievable strength who was an all-purpose employee of dr slocum while they were camped at barstow one night archie went up town to pass a cheerful hour and during the course of the evening a brawl started and archie suddenly found himself the object of a mass attack by five burly miners archie knocked them down as they came threw them out and returned to his drinking the constable went in to take archie archie tossed him through the door the officer didn't want to kill him and collecting a posse of four brawny helpers tried again archie pitched them out being a friend of slocum the constable now went to see the doctor doc can't you come down and do something about archie knowing how you need him i don't want to kill him dr slocum went discovered that archie after throwing everybody out of the place had seized the long heavy bar turned it on its side and was sitting on the edge with a bottle in each hand dr slocum regarded the wreckage and then archie good lord archie what have you done nothing doc archie said just having a nip take one on the house what about this fight fight repeated archie oh that some fellows tried to start a little ruckus but i didn't pay much attention to it but if archie had no fear of a dozen live men he was terrorized by a dead one dr and mrs slocum with archie were leaving their camp in the panama the thermometer under the canopy of the vehicle registered a hundred and thirty five degrees hot for an april day even in death valley country as they drove along the doctor noticed some clothing on a bush seems strange he said let's look around archie skirmished through the bushes presently he returned his face white horror in his eyes he grabbed the wagon wheel his quivering bulk shaking the heavy loaded vehicle for god's sake dog go and look the doctor saw a sight as pitiable as it is ever man's lot to see a young fellow dying from thirst on the desert his protruding tongue split in the middle unable to speak though retaining a spark of life the fingers of both hands worn to stubs kneeling dr slocum asked the victim where he came from where he wished to go no sign came from the staring eyes finally the doctor said well we want to help you we have water we're going to take you home at the mention of home a feeble smile came and two tears the last two drops in that wasted body rolled down his cheeks and dried in the desert sun and then he died there was nothing to do but bury the body you'll have to help me archie the doctor said a look of terror came into archie's eyes doc he pleaded ask me anything but that the man who'd cleaned up barstow quailed in superstitious fear at the thought of touching the dead they looked around for a place to dig a grave but the country was covered with malpai and lava rock and they couldn't dig in it the doctor wrapped the body in a piece of canvas and mrs slocum aided in lifting it into the wagon she drove the team while the doctor and archie walked along looking for loose earth and finally found a spot archie dug the grave the doctor lowered the body and archie with shut eyes filled the grave a press story of the finding brought a flood of letters from all parts of the country such stories always do from mothers wives sweethearts but none from men it's always the woman who cares such deaths are due to inexperience this boy had no canteen just around the corner of a jutting hill was lone willow spring 
though scarcely a vestige remains there was once a town at lone willow saloons and an enormous dance hall lured the bad boys and there the trail ended for scores reported as missing men cyclone wilson a nephew of shady myrick who built a sizable export trade in gemstones and for whom myrick springs is named was taking a wagon load of chinese coolies to work at old harmony all chinamen looked alike to cyclone and he didn't know that these were newcomers it was his custom to discharge his passengers at the foot of a steep hill near lone willow and require them to walk to the top as usual upon reaching this grade he set his brakes and waited for the coolies to get out none moved then he ordered them out the chinaman sat in stony silence he repeated the order with no result other than jabber among themselves angered cyclone reached for his long black snake whip it had a cracker on the end of it which was buckshot with unerring accuracy he aimed the whip at the nearest coolie and overboard he went the others leaped out and drawing knives from their big loose sleeves massed for assault cyclone reached for a pistol always carried on the wagon seat and started shooting his toll was five chinamen the cause of the murders it was later learned was due entirely to the fact that none of the chinamen had understood a word cyclone had spoken a chinaman at lone willow who spoke english made his countrymen bury the dead today ballarat is a ghost town and soon every trace of it will be gone roofless walls lift like prayerful arms to gods that are deaf in the late afternoon when the shadows of the argus range have crept across the valley a few old-timers come out of leaning dobies and stand bareheaded to look about the afterglow of a sun is upon the peaks and the afterglow of dreams in their hearts they people the empty streets with men long dead some in unmarked graves in the little cemetery on the flat just beyond the town some on the trails god only knows where these dead they see pass in and out of the old saloons these dead they hear again glasses tinkle slippered feet dance again tomorrow their pale eyes lift to the canyons and though dimmed a little they see one hundred billion dollars what of shoshone it remains with changes of course the shanties hauled from greenwater have been hauled somewhere else no longer do i step from my car as i have so often and call to those on the bench move over fellas and hear their familiar greeting where the hell have you been instead i drive to an air-conditioned cabin and stroll back to the former side of the bench so long the social center there i see a sign over a door which reads crowbar and i enter a dreamy cavern with dimmed rosy lights hear the music of ice against glass and refuse to believe the startling sight of an honest-to-goodness old-timer tending bar in a clean white shirt likewise i balk at the white lines i walk between as i cross the asphalt road to the store but above shoshone the same blue skies stretch without end over a world apart and under them are the same uncrowded trails the same far horizons for the vagabond's foot and the peace which passeth all understanding end of chapter twenty five end of loafing along death valley trails a personal narrative of people and places by william carruthers